All right, thank you. Hello everyone, this is the weekly TSC call. As you, I think, all know, given the list of attendees we have or participants we have today, where is Gary? Gary is coming. So um, you all know that we have to live by the antitrust policy, the notice of which is currently displayed on your screen, and the code of conduct that governs uh, the way we're interacting within Hyperledger and to stay out of trouble. Uh, to get started, I just want to start with a bunch of reminders. Um, as we talked about many times, there's the newsletter is still up. I listened to the recording from two weeks ago uh, when Tracy, uh, you know, chaired the call. You guys talked a lot about breaking silos and it seemed like the newsletter was referenced a few times as maybe one of the ways that could be leveraged to increase communications across the community. And uh, that does imply that people jump in onto the opportunity to use the newsletter. So please uh, do consider the newsletter, contributing to the newsletter. The Global Forum, the of first period for the call for proposals closed last week, at the end of last week, but uh, they have extended it. So you still have a few more days if you haven't managed to submit your proposal before the first deadline. And then the mentorship program, on the other end, the period for proposals has closed. And so we are now going through a review by the TSC members. And um, basically we were asked to submit uh, a review by uh, March 24th. So you should all have, all the TSC members should have received an email in that regard. Please do respond. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of interesting proposals, uh, but it doesn't take that much time to go through them and get an idea of, you know, what's there. So that's for the announcements. Is there anything else anybody wants to announce now? I don't see anybody raising their hand or getting off mute. All right, so we can get going. So quality report, we've received two reports. So Silas responded to my prompt. I pinged him, uh, you know, as Tracy pointed out in the call a couple of weeks ago when I wasn't there. Uh, that you know, I, I told her I was going to ping Silas, and he, I did, and he said, "Yeah, I'm busy with release, but uh, we'll do it next week," and he did. So we have a pretty comprehensive uh, uh, report, as I had uh, indicated. Also, it was pretty clear looking at the Insights dashboard that they had a lot of activity, even though we had not heard from them in a while, and it wasn't you know because they were not, they had disappeared. By no means they have. They have actually been quite busy working on their code and they have added a whole bunch of things. And um, you may have seen in the report that uh, they have a piece uh, that they would like to socialize beyond their project because they think it's relevant to other projects. And it's called Vent. And so I've invited Silas to present it will uh, will take uh, 20 minutes or so of next week's call for him to uh, present to everybody what Vent is about and how it might be relevant to other projects. Okay. Is there any other questions or comments on this? And otherwise, there was the uh, there was a. Uh, a report from the Ursa project. There's no specific comments other than the usual, please, you know, if there are interested parties, we're always welcoming input and feedback from others. So, I mean, this was posted yesterday, so I understand not everybody may have had a chance to look at that one, but uh, if there are any questions, Hot is here. I'm sure you can answer questions on uh, Earth. 
Paul, is there anything you want to add? Or did I do a good enough job at bringing that up was your perfect. call? That was perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. If there is no comments or questions, uh, Shen, go ahead. Shen Yang, I can't hear you. Sean, I saw it. Yeah, I saw you raise your hand and unmute, but we can't hear you, Sean. I imagine Sean fighting with his machine, trying to figure out which level has been muted. Um, hello. Ah. Um, hello. I, I would just like to make the um, borrow no. Okay, you come through by the very scrambled, but you can try. Can you hear me now? Very poorly, but we can hear you. Um, yes, I just wanted to make the, uh, the point that um, apart from then, Borono has um, complete. No, sorry. So I'd sure. like to make the point that apart from It's breaking up too bad. We can't really understand. Could we you only could, get small could you, bits of? Could you ask in the chat, uh, in the in the TSC chat channel, Sean? Because I, I see that. Sorry. Too bad. All right. He says something about Burrow, but I don't know what it was. He, he's typing. Right, there we go. Yeah. Suspense is killing me. Well. All right. Maybe I should continue anyway, and we can get. There we go. Okay. All right, let's continue and keep an eye on the TSC channel for some input from comments from uh, Sean as well. Okay, so that gets us into the discussion part of the agenda. There are quite a few items I wanted to bring up today. The first one is with regard to the implementation of the decision we had made regarding the common repository structure and the use of repo linter. We actually have a decision that was recorded in, that says something about the fact that every repository should have a copy of RippleLinter uh, JSON uh, file. This is the configuration file. And as we discussed uh, a few weeks ago, you know, uh, we've realized this is a poor idea because it makes it, you know, it creates like many, many different uh, copies and it's going to become a maintenance nightmare. So we had said we should try to see if we couldn't all use the same, you know, common repository, I mean, RippleInter config file instead. I actually spent a bit of time. There is a, there is a way for RippleInter. There's a, a, you know, an argument that allows you to reference a URL. So you can actually download the config file from the net. And so, I sent an email to the maintainers list instructing people to try and do that. And uh, the idea is that, so in the lab, um, in the community tools repo, we have this config uh, file that we can all share. And if there are changes that need to be made because you know nobody says the config file is perfect as it is, um, we should try to change that one common file. And so I have asked people on the maintainers list to try to, you know, to, to experiment with it. And several projects already have reported success in doing so. And if you have problems, please speak up, let us know what's wrong and possibly 
make proposal for changes, you know, you can submit a PR against the config file. Just keep in mind that it should be usable by everybody. So it's not a matter of just taking out what's the relevant to your project. And so that's maybe one of the challenges is when, you know, this approach requires that we tolerate things that are maybe not relevant to our projects. And sometimes Ripple Inter sends, you know, it will report stuff. And typically they're not flagged as errors. They are more like warnings and you just have to ignore those, which makes the, the output a bit more verbose and a bit more, you know, kind of inconvenient to go through to spot the errors. But I think it's a small price to pay. Now, there are people who have reported problems running Ripple Inter altogether. I personally have been using it against Node version 12 without problems, but I know people have had problems. Dano has pointed out there is actually uh, the Fabric team actually put together a container that you can use instead. And so if you're not on maintainers lists, or if, you know, uh, please, you should subscribe. I have to give, I want to give the uh, right credit on the maintainers list uh, work he has done. He, he went through, you know, major, um, how do I say that, update effort to try to add as many people he could find you know, scrubbing all the different repositories we have around Hyperledger and adding people to the list. And I have to say, I've never seen that maintainers list with that much traffic before, which is very encouraging. I think we need to try and do that more rather than less. It's been a shame that this list was pretty much silent always. And so I'm, I'm kind of encouraged to see a bit of traffic. And so this is one of the topics that, you know, I brought up on the maintainers list. And so if people are, want to have, you know, guidance on how to do this, or if they have feedbacks on the use of Ripple Inter, they should actually go to this list, report there, ask questions, you know, that kind of stuff. I think it's, a, it's good progress. Uh, as I said, there are people who have had problems running it. Silas said it doesn't work with the newer version of Node. I mean, I don't know what else to say on that one. I mean, he was saying we need better tools, which, you know, it's hard to argue against, but I don't, uh, I don't know that this, you know, is a complete showstopper either. So I think we probably need to get to help Ripple Inter to get better as well, if we can at the same time. Ripple Inter is uh, produced by the Tudu group, which is just another, you know, bunch of volunteers. And so if there is a, if there are problems, we should just try to fix them and then improve Ripple Inter as well. So I don't know if anybody else has any comments or questions on this. I wanted to give an update. That's where we are. If my, my idea is that, you know, I'm sensing that we are still following the right thread here, the right path, we're on the right path. And what I would like to do is if we can confirm that this is a workable approach, I would like us to basically make a new decision that would override the previous one, which was, you know, which said that we should all have a copy of the config file in the repo and instead, you know, change that decision to say, this is the common, use the, use the file that is shared by everybody as the config file. But I'm, I didn't want to jump again and make that proposal already. I figured, well, at this point is might as well keep continuing the experiment. And as people get, you know, we, we can sort out the problems, then uh, it'll still be time to make that official. Troy? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, I don't think we're ready for that. Um, I, I did make modifications to make that work in Aries Framework Go. Um, I think that's one point. I think another point is there's Go rules in this thing. Um, and I think a third point relates to what we talked about earlier that um, I think there is customizations for repos about like how to exclude certain files, test files, these kind of things. Um, and I understand the idea that, you know, hey, it just shows up as warnings, but those warnings are kind of useless when you can't customize it for your repo. Um, I'd rather create them as errors and actually have it very specific to the repo. Um, so that, you know, if there's a license missing or any of these kind of things, um, all the all the files for that particular language are properly ignored um, and uh, can be addressed. 
So I'm not entirely sure yet that it's true. There can only just be one um, one file. And I'm, I am concerned that, um, you know, this, we, we talk about Node a lot, but what about Go? You yeah. actually just touched on a question that I have, which is, uh, can we do a code base per repo overrides? Like, can we specify multiple config files? Um, and if so, I think it's a, you get to a fusion of both, right? You have like the main one and then on repos where the main one is kind of too verbose, you have the per repo one. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that question. I agree it's a good one. And maybe, you know, maybe even if Repolinter doesn't do it today, maybe it'd be a good extension to try to get, because I would be more comfortable with that if we had like a common config file and then we can say, well, here's the way you can, you know, override some of the rules locally, but at least it would still kind of, like you said, right, get, you know, the, the good of both the ways. Any other comments? And maybe in the end, you know, the decision is, well, try to use the common one. And then if you have really a good reason, then create a local copy. And that could still be, you know, a, a reasonable outcome. I still think it would be better than the general rule of just create a local copy because creating local copies just for the sake of it is kind of just creating a problem of maintenance for no good reasons. So that's why I didn't like, I don't like the, the, the current decision that's on Rager that says create a copy, but I can appreciate that in some cases, this may not be the right thing either to use the common one. So there may be some middle ground that we can find there. If, if I might, um, Sean did comment in the TSC. I'll, I'll read this into the record. Sean Young says, I just wanted to point out that Burrow now also has eWASM support. This means that with Solang, we can compile Solidity and run it on Burrow. It works end to end. This will also work with other eWASM tooling. Since Fabric, Sawtooth, and Aroha already use the Burrow EVM implementation, merging eWASM support as well should be easy. This would bring eWASM and Solang support to those ledgers. So that's uh, that's what Sean said. Yep. Thank you for reading it out loud so it can be on the record. Thank you for pointing that out, Sean. All right. Anything else? Otherwise, I think we'll pursue the experiment with Repolinter and see how it goes. But again, I mean, you know, we can't do that on our own. Everybody has to kind of chime in and try, you know, try for your own repo and uh, send feedback. That's the only way we'll be able to make progress and come to a resolution that works for everyone. All right. If we're done with that one, I don't see anybody raising their hands. We can move on to the next item. So I sent an email um, about that. You know, so what happened is uh, Chris Anisik from uh, the Linux Foundation gave a presentation to the Hyperledger Governing Board on Monday um, about the lessons learned from CNCF and Kubernetes. And there was a lot of very interesting information. And um, the idea was, well, is there anything we can leverage to make Hyperledger a better place? You know, learning from other projects. And uh, in, you know, I'll talk more about that in the next item, but one of the things that I found, you know, as we was going through is, is, is charts, is, you know, they were, it was talking about the different phases they have in their life cycle for the projects. So they have something called sandbox, which is very similar to the labs, very low entry barrier, and uh, people can create that pretty you know, uh, easily. And then they go to incubation, and then they go to graduated status. So they, they, they use the verb, so they say, oh, this project is being incubated or is incubating, and then they graduate it. And, and, and then they have something like archived. And so it's not very different from what we have. But as you know, 
we use the words active for the status, which is like, you know, the, the, the main one after incubation. And uh, I, we've always had problem with this. It's been a very difficult uh, thing to communicate. People interpret it typically the wrong way unless they've been educated the hard way. <laughs> so I, you know, I thought, wow, this is such a much better word, graduated. And honestly, part of me was like, okay, but it's just not worth the trouble of changing the names we have, forget it. But then I was like, no, maybe that's the wrong approach. We should be more proactive and say, no, we have something wrong. It doesn't work well. And here's a better solution. Let's just make the move and change the name we have. After all, you know, we do, we're not set in stone. We can make those changes. And if it's an improvement, why not doing it? So I actually would like the TSC to consider renaming the active status to graduated. And as I said in my email, I think it has actually quite a few uh, advantages uh, over the, the current name. First, you know, active is just such a poor characterization of what is conveyed, right? You all know what's in the incubation executoria, and there's a lot of things way beyond whether you being active or not, <laughs> literally, right? And, uh, and so, and then there's this, there was this notion that it was brought up several times, like, well, maybe some project that, you know, did uh, got out of incubation, they wouldn't meet the exit criteria anymore. And that's a bit of a problem too. We don't have this way of, you know, re-evaluating. It's a one-time thing. And when I was thinking about graduated, I was like, you know, it's, exactly the same when you talk about graduation. It's a thing you have done at one point in your, in your life. Typically, you graduate from high school, university, college, whatever. And that's all it says. You graduated at one point, right? Uh, and, and so I thought this is much more fitting than what we have today. So I, I saw, um, you know, there was one person who said, yeah, I like this. I think that's a good move. And nobody else commented on the mailing list. So I don't know. I really don't know if people think this is just silly, waste of our time. If they say, sure, that's a no-brainer <laughs> or what. Even Arun, who typically speaks up on every issue we raise, and that's a good thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm not criticizing by any means. He, you know, has not said anything. So I would like to invite the TSC member to speak up on this issue. Tracy. Yeah, so I added a comment to the uh, proposal or the decision uh, entry that you had. We currently use graduated um, in two different places and you can find that basically by Googling. But uh, we use it when we talk about labs that have graduated to top level projects. We use it when we talk about uh, projects graduating from incubation to active. Um, so I, my concern is that we've already used the word for meaning potentially something else. Um, and I'm, you know, wondering if there's going to be confusion over it. Okay, that sounds like a valid concern. Thank you. Nathan? I liked the explanation that you just gave Arno about um, the way we use the word graduation for kids in school um, and how it's okay to graduate more than once. Um, I think it, I, my main concern was the same thing that Tracy expressed that the graduating from labs versus graduating to act or to active or becoming graduated. I don't know how we'll say that all the time going forward, um, but I do really like the improvement in the terminology in the sense that right now active projects imply that the other projects are inactive, which is a, a very negative connotation and doesn't do what we want to do from a community standpoint. Whereas um, working to achieve graduation or putting more effort in so you can graduate um, seems like a much more reasonable connotation. Um, and I think my opinion of that is the same one that you expressed earlier that um, it's an improvement in the language. Um, it certainly doesn't seem to be, uh, we are not regressing. It seems like it, there are some problems with it, but it feels like there are fewer problems than what we have now. So 
you know, if we just sat, decided to vote on it, I would probably vote in favor. All right, thank you. Tracy is back on. Yeah, sorry. Um, so Nathan made me think about uh, how we might reword if we want to go with graduate it. Um, so right now we say graduate it to. Uh, we may want to say graduate it from. So graduate it from labs, graduate it from incubation. Yeah, I don't know. Grace. Grace. Yeah, just echoing. I, I like uh, what Nathan and Tracy have said about, um, you know, active is not, um, it, it can be misleading to outsiders, especially for projects that are very active, but not um, haven't had that kind of promoted status. So in the proposal, I'd love it to be more specific, as Tracy said, uh, for the language of, um, I think I think CNCF does promoted to graduate status and the promoted kind of, and that kind of indicates that uh, process. Uh, my other question though, and I apologize if I'm um, uh, missing something, but the, are we gonna be taking this decision kind of separately from the badging proposal? I feel like we probably need a decision on both the, to then decide if we're using uh, I know there are some conversations about getting rid of the active and incubation statuses for the project badging proposal. I'm not sure where that sits. So then it feels a little premature to then have this decision if we're not sure if this process is going to stay around um, uh, beyond that. But but I could be misremembered. So I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, no, no, this, this is a absolutely a fair question. And, you know, I have wrestled with that one myself. It's like, we are working on this badging proposal and there was this, but we haven't really, I mean, we have said, well, maybe that would eventually replace the phases, the status we have, but we haven't made the decision. And, and there are people I've heard, and maybe, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I've heard people say they were not necessarily comfortable with that. And so I have, come to the conclusion that, well, this the future on whether badging will is here to stick and whether even further than that, it will replace the phases we have is highly uncertain. And I thought, well, this renaming is a low hanging fruit we can do. And if we get rid of the whole phases eventually, well, there's not much harm. It's a bit of a waste of time, admittedly, you know, there'll be some effort to update the docs, but I think it's still fairly minimal. So I figured, well, I don't think we should hold off on trying to make the situation better just because maybe down the line we'll have the badges. So that's why I decided to, you know, bring it up anyway now. But you, you, you know, I would appreciate, you know, I'll respect anybody who says, oh no, this is a waste of time. Let's just go for the end goal badging and forget this but you know i let me this is a bit subjective because nobody has a crystal ball and will know how long it, the, this is here to stay or not and so I, back to the the i wanted to clarify what you said grace on the promoted are you saying where, can you repeat that part? Because it sounded interesting. Is, is that a solution if we can avoid the word graduated the way we use it today for labs to project? Could we say they have been promoted to project and then we can keep graduated for projects that go from incubation to graduated? Would that solve the problem? Yeah, that was the proposal I was making just because I think in the proposal we wanna be clear on, yeah, uh, that exact language, just so that way every project can be using the same thing. But yeah, that that was one one idea. Yeah, no, I think this is interesting. Tracy, I mean, you brought that up, which is again, thank you because I did not realize that. I have to admit, that's why we have more than one person here, and uh, it, and it is good. Uh, but do you think something like this could solve the problem or do you think it's so entrenched people talk about graduated project or labs to project 
we can't really fix that. We have to use a new term. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think we're still hanging on to people who want to use the word hyperledger or the phrase hyperledger project when in, uh, at some point in the past it was changed to hyperledger, right? Um, so I think cha sometimes changing language can be hard and it takes a concerted effort for people to do that. Um, I, I mean, I've, I'm more than willing to make the concerted effort if that's the direction that we head. So uh, I just think that we need to make sure that it, everybody is thinking in that way because otherwise it, I do think that it can get confusing, right? Especially if you say a lab graduated to a top level project, some people might take that to mean, oh, they're in the graduated status, right? Um, and that's not really what was meant by that, right? They, they have to really make the effort to say that a lab was promoted to a top level project. Yeah. And I mean, you know, there are other issues, right? I, I keep wrestling with the fact that, I mean, and I don't blame anybody, even I say that sometimes people talk about lab projects and we have to say, no, <laughs> you know, a lab is a lab, a project is a project. There's no such thing as a lab project. Yeah. But so it's a bit like this, I think, you know, there's only so many terms we have at our disposal and we have to disambiguate. And sometimes it does require a little bit of, you know, like a brain gymnastic kind of thing to not confuse things. Um, but I kind of like the idea of using promoter to talk about labs to incubation, you know, project and incubation. And if all the docs were clear on that, Maybe we should have an FAQ somewhere and say, what does graduated mean? And we say, you know, people may refer to this, but the reality is, and we kind of, you know, specify what is the right interpretation and the right usage for those could, terms. Could I ask what the potential uh, downside is? Because the people who are going to be reading these, you know, tea leaves from the TSC, are going to be new contributors, new people who are coming on board, who, unlike me, haven't been exposed to calling it the Hyperledger Project. Um, so for people who have been here for a while, there will be this little bit of mental gymnastics when you say the word graduated. For people who are new, they're not going to have that baggage. Uh, I would just ask, you know, what is, what is the downside? We say, you know, before this, after this flag date, is that, um, sorry for the confusion. Yeah. I see Hart said on the, the chat channel, what about using another term like mature or something else to adult? I, I think that was actually, at some point this came up, but I don't think anybody wants to be called <laughs> I have a mature project for some reason. It doesn't sound very positive to me. Arun? Hi. So when um, when Arnold was explaining about CNCF and the way Kubernetes does work today, it sounded so simple. It sounded there are just three stages. You start at one and then you eventually mature. And then fin final goal would be, I mean, I hope project would continue, but there is some archival stage, right? When there is yeah. no project work going on. Um, so it sounded very simple, like everybody knows there are just three stages on, on in its life cycle. And um, in fact, one of the comment which I added, I'm not sure, um, probably I added yesterday night, late night India time um, on, on that proposal is right now we, we do our, I mean, we are trying to solve this understanding issue, which is in within Hyperledger community using multiple proposals. I guess this is the same question which is brought up by Tracy and, and um, Grace as well, right? A little while ago. Um, so should we focus on one and then make it simple or should we make this intermediate? I mean, for me, this is kind of an interim solution that we change naming and then we switch back to another proposal, keep working on it. One personal experience which I have seen within the community is 
because I also interact with many people here in India. So they kept asking me that Aries is now become active. So people did not have that concept of activeness. They thought project became stable as part of this active. So until then people were saying, okay, Aries was still under development. Now it is um, kind of stable. Hyperledger has released it and they are recommending Aries. That's, that's the kind of feedback that I heard within the community here. So these kind of words, they do make a difference on what we choose. So probably we take some time and then finalize on one approach. Yeah, I mean, I agree that those those words are, you know, they, they do carry some weight, right? And uh, but um, so you're saying you'd rather wait? I, I'm not sure what you're recommending in the end. Right. So since we are solving similar problem through multiple means, um, probably we should we should wait for some more time. So like doing the badging is what you're saying. What other ways are you talking about? Is that what you're right. referring to, badging? Right, badging is so what you're I saying, was saying. You'd rather we keep working on the badging and not touch anything until we are sorted out the badging? Yes. Okay. Because badging is also kind of defining maturity status. And um, so this, this word, the, the choice of word that we are making here, active or graduated, it is also kind of defining the maturity status. So probably we should finalize and then, I, I like this wording, there is no comment on that. Just that I feel like we should finalize on one process. Okay. No, I, I appreciate that, uh, you know, it's definitely a viable option. Um, I. Anyone else? I mean, Dano, you're proposing the badging. How do you see those things? Do you think that we shouldn't touch this? It's a waste of our time or are you okay with us doing this kind of change while we are experimenting with badging? Um, <clears throat> I mean, I'm, I'm the mixed feelings of it. Um, as far as badging, my understanding is we were waiting on people who wanted to see the automation to come up with the counter proposal. So that's kind of why it stalled there, you know, to get the details of what they were looking for and the automated values. Um, but, you know, if, if we're going to change the name of the current process, that, that does give weight that we're going to keep the current process. So it, it is kind of forcing the issue of whether badging, you know, I really feels like we should do one or the other. We should either move the badging or we should change the name because doing both is going to send mixed signals. So I think we really need to have to have a decision and come to a realization of, are we going to stick with the current process or are we going to move the badging? And then from that, you know, we would move to one or the other. You know, that's, that's just, that's my main concern is, you know, we're trying to do both is like not doing either justice. All right. Thanks for the input. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'll take a bit of time to respond to it because I have been struggling with that myself before bringing it up at all. But I, I feel differently because part of me, I kind of expect we will still have those statuses, even with the badging. I think the badging, it, we have started with a set of badges that pretty much you know, try to capture what's in the incubation exit criteria, but there is no reason to limit ourselves to this. We could capture a lot of other things and the problem is you're going to have a whole series of badges, which, you know, is not going to be practical for everybody to refer to all the time. And there is still some value in having some kind of high level label that admittedly only capture one dimension, not all of them, but, you know, that I still might have some value in having that. So I, I'm kind of, somewhat expecting that we might, the, the, ba the badging won't put an end to the, to the phases. This is kind of where I am. So I'm kind but of thinking there could wrong. be- I mean, you guys might say, no, I know you're wrong. <laughs> That's fine. I, I, I think there's room for fusion in this to where to say to go to incubation, you need to have this set of badges at the same time. 
to go to graduated, you need to have another set of badges at the same time. And maybe we could even create, you know, a super, you know, call these project levels ranks. You know, you got incubating, you always get to keep it. You got graduated. When you get graduated, you always yes. have it. And maybe we could create this extra rank above it that have, you know, a certain set of badges above and beyond to come and go. Maybe we have premier projects that have, you know, more and you got to renew that premier every year. But we would need to change some of the expectation that these, these ranks you have, you can lose premier because you didn't keep your contributor decentralization up. Um, you know, I think there's opportunity to kind of keep the carrot out in front of projects if we, and then we would need to figure out, you know, what does Premier mean, do you have bonuses? I think there's room for this, but I really think we need to get the foundation settled before we can really discuss some of these deeper possibilities. No, but I think these are indeed the possible uh, things that might happen down the line, but uh, yeah, this is interesting. Uh, Angelo has his hand up. Yeah, yeah, th thank you. Arnett. I, I must admit, uh, I'm not a native speaker, an uh, English speaker, so the, the, I don't see all the nuances, the, the nuance between behind the, the the wording. But what I understood is that uh, there there are different understandings of what what's behind these these words. So to me, the word itself doesn't mean much as long as we have a clear definition written somewhere of what's behind uh, this word. Now, if it's active or graduate or any other word, I don't mind. I mean, the, the, if we change just the word, but that we don't make the, the concept more clear, clear. I mean, we are not. Uh, what's the point of uh, renaming the renaming variables? I mean, if the variable has still the same meaning, uh, uh, either the meaning is not clear, and therefore we have to to write a, a better paragraph for uh, for the meaning, or otherwise, maybe I would agree that uh, it's better to move to a solution that. Uh, would, that would a deeper solution that would solve more problems like can be badges I, actually even though i'm not very in uh, I'm, I'm still uh, i didn't make my mind around that but uh, i kind of agree that changing names and then proposing badging and do this and that i mean it probably can create more confusion than other things but just my opinion thank you all right no but i appreciate your input thank you and just to answer one thing is i agree with you that you know those things need to be defined anyway, no matter what term we use. And the thing is, the problem today is there is no problem, I think, in terms of you know, what defining what active means. The problem is people don't go to the definition to figure out what it means. They will infer some meaning just based on the name. And this is they will run with that in their head and talk about it with that kind of assumption base, you know, right? And what I'm trying to do is try to make it so that maybe for those people, we're not going to follow the link and figure out, okay, what does it mean for a project to be active or graduated, that they would have a better, or more likely, you know, a better understanding of what it might mean. That's all. But look, there's more things on the agenda. I appreciate the reactions and input from everybody. This is not, uh, you know, I, I didn't expect a final decision on this. I just wanted to bring it up. I encourage other people to continue the discussion on the wiki page or in email, whatever you prefer. And we can talk about it some more. Uh, let it sink in and think about this. Uh, we have 15 minutes left. I wanted to touch on some other points that I got from this uh, presentation that was given. That is more food for thoughts. And uh, it doesn't require us to make a decision per se, but it was really, you know, in keeping with, so, you know, the crux of the, the, the presentation was very much like, okay, what are the things that a project like Hyperledger can do uh, to try to, you know, uh, favor growing the community overall? And it's interesting because, so they have very similar, you know, characteristics in some ways. So for instance, and there is a link to the charts, I think you can access them. And um, the, the link on lessons learned from Kubernetes and CF, CF point to the charts. And most of them, I think, are self-explanatory for the most part. But, uh, you know, there are things, like I said, the number of phases they have is quite similar. They also have uh, this policy to allow competing projects to exist let the market decide. Uh, and, and so there is quite a bit of similarity in some ways. They also have the situations where some projects are, you know, uh, 
uh, dominated by a single vendor. And I did mention in my email the gRPC case, which is highly popular, used everywhere. Uh, this, but you know, Google is dominating gRPC, and for that reason, they are still in incubation, and they are just being told that's how it is. Either you fix your community or you stay in incubation, which I thought was kind of interesting. And uh, but so, practically speaking, though, there were in that presentation some tidbits that I thought, wow. This is really interesting. I, we really need to be aware of those things, we being hyperledger community, and see if we couldn't implement some of those, you know, activities within our own communities to try to improve and you know grow the community. So the first one was this idea of gamifying the issue triage. And the idea is to basically allow a broader set of people to contribute to you know, prioritizing issues that are being tackled by the developers of a given project. And so there's different tools you can use for this, but fundamentally it's like, you know, they, they have this triage party. There's a tool that was developed by Google where you can have like, you know, the, the, the maintainers, they're sitting there and they go and they can vote and, and decide how, you know, what should be, uh, addressed as a priority over others and this is done in a much more collaborative and dynamic way and uh, and 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 also with input from the broader community so instead of being just the maintainers decide oh this is what we're going to tackle next you can say no let's you know leave it to the community to vote on those issues and 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 try to sort out all the different issues um, and then, so I'll go through the different points that I wanted to raise. Uh, there's two main ones. So this was the first one. And the second one uh, has to do with release manager. So the, what they're trying to do is rotate the release manager. So within a given project, they try to rotate the release manager every, every uh, release. And in support of that, because what happens often, right? We, most of our projects, they have one, a, you know, uh, dominating vendor, and uh, they typically are the release manager. And one of the reasons, I mean, one of the ways to increase contribution from outside, you know, outsiders is to give them the control over the release. And in fact, it's interesting because it's not necessarily something that's that critical in terms of like, you know, it's not like a company is going to be necessarily, um, uh, worried about, oh, you know, giving up control or, you know, uh, polluting the code by, you know, that kind of stuff that sometimes make people reluctant uh, to, to outside contribution. Uh, the release management is something very important, obviously. You need somebody who is dedicated to do the right thing, but at the same time, it's something that's fairly mechanical and that you can actually uh, train people to do and so that's the other part they have a shadow program where basically they are making this effort so that you know somebody who is interested in becoming a release manager can volunteer to shadow the re current release manager so they go through a release cycle maybe two depending on how they are comfortable you know taking over and then the next release they do it themselves and this is a good way to bring all new people on board making them part of the community. Um, so I wanted to bring those things up and ask you know, if there are any reactions and this is the kind of ideas that I find refreshing and I thought, oh, this is cool. Why can't we do this? You know, And we don't have to make that a policy. I'm not talking about like, you know, making a decision at the TSC level saying, yeah, everybody should do gamify, you know, should gamify their issue prioritization. I'm not talking about any of this. I'm really talking about like, hey, these are cool ideas. What do you guys think? And try to socialize them in our community so that people can maybe be, you know, enticed to trying them out. Yeah. So, Dano. So I think one thing that would be helpful, at least for the release process, is to get our arms around who does the releases for each project today? Is it one company always doing it? Do they have a dedicated team? Do they share it around? you know is the release process documented is it some magic checklist that exists in someone's head 
So even if, if we don't, you know, do this, there's some, some stuff to learn about it that would, I think, help stabilize the projects. Because as far as release management goes, let's say, for example, that, you know, IBM gets out of software completely, not going to happen. But, you know, can they still, the project still live if other companies can release it? And that's the value I see in having other contributors able to drive the release is what if the person who's got all the magic stuff in his mind, you know, quits the industry. Um, that way, if it's rotated around people, it increases the bus number from one. So I totally support the idea of that, of what, what's on these things. All right, thank you. Any other reactions? And maybe maybe there are projects that do this kind of stuff. I don't know. It also be you know it's kind of a prompt as well to to others you know to everybody. I mean to to speak up if there are things like this you've been trying or thinking about that maybe you know we would all benefit from using you know or trying at least. I you know and I don't know how much of this actually works, cost or any of this, but. When I saw the presentation, I was like, damn, this is pretty good, interesting ideas. We should try that out. So that's why I wanted to bring it up. I don't see anybody raising their hands. Is there a, uh, Troy? Yeah, I, I think sometimes these discussions based on previous decisions, um, we might forget that there are sub projects, even though the TSC um, doesn't see them as sub projects um, in an official capacity. And I think what happens in some of the uh, projects is there are different release managers for these different sub components. Um, so I'm not entirely sure this um, uh, ends up with only one company, even within a project, because some of these projects have multiple components to them. <laughs> I agree, but that, that, I think that di the difference at that level to me is irrelevant because you, you make it at the repo level, whatever, you know, there's always a, a, a point where you're going to have some release manager and the same principle can be applied at that level. It's the same for issues and all, right? In Fabric, we have many different repos and, you know, we have issues that are not all in the same bag, right? So you you could imagine entering implementing this kind of processes at the repo level that's fine or sub project as you call it so i, I think once you get specialized like that there might be less i, I mean I, I kind of find this a little bit in theory sometimes it's just when you have kind of component breakdowns like that there just isn't necessarily as much diversity at the so-called sub project level um as at the parent project level um so it's just a little more difficult okay nathan this feels to me like something that's really a, a good thing to encourage and a good thing to promote um but it's it can very easily cross in, over into too much governance meaning too many rules or too many prescriptions that um make it feel like to the developers there's just there's more hoops to jump through than it's worth than is worth the effort um i think for most open source projects you want just enough governance and no more um the, the kind of less is more and uh just because uh it's hard enough to keep track of the project itself especially when you're working as a volunteer that if there's a lot of um bulk work of the governance that's involved or a lot of rules to follow um it gets to be too much really quickly um that doesn't mean we shouldn't point to it and say this is a better way of doing it and if you do it this way you'll have less problems and you can keep your governance smaller because it will go better for you um but i think if we start saying here's the checklist that you have to follow or you know if you if you can't stop and think about whether there's an exception to the rule here for instance maybe you're in a sub project that doesn't have sufficient diversity for this to work um, that you, you know you you need to be able to think on your feet and apply these principles in, a, in an intelligent way. Um, we don't want to just say do this or you don't qualify um, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, but and again, I want to be very clear on this. I'm by no means proposing we make any of these things requirements or policies that need to be implemented across the board. They're really only meant as food for thoughts, ideas, I mean, 
you know, you have to recognize that a lot of the reports from group from the projects often call for help from the TSC to, you know, grow the community and, and so on, bring new contributors and whatnot. And so I felt like, hey, here's some tips that you can take on, you know, in your own project and try to leverage this maybe as a way to grow your community. So this is really what it's all about and nothing more. I want to be clear on this. I, I agree with you. I think I wouldn't want to add extra burden in terms of governance requirements. David? David, and then I think we're gonna have to close the call. Well, I think this is great. I mean, bringing in good ideas from other projects is, is a really smart thing to do, I think. So thank you for sharing it. And I, I think, you know, based on the comments, it, it doesn't necessarily port over exactly like they're doing it there. But I do think the idea of a shadow program, maybe for a range of different roles, maybe beyond just the release manager or not even for the release manager, does tie into things we've talked about in this call. But how do we, you know, foster more mentorship uh, in the community. So I think, you know, just the idea of a shadow program for any community role there might be is a good one. So yeah, I would encourage people to see how it might apply. So, and let's look at other, you know, things that are working well in other communities too and bring in those ideas. Absolutely. And this is also what I mean, what I meant to do there is to, to say, hey, look, when we look around, there are ideas that can be worth leveraging for our own communities. So, if you know be on the lookout for other good ideas that we might bring up and maybe they they don't get used that's okay but i still think it's interesting to bring them up all right with that being said thank you all for your participation i'm going to close the call on this and uh, all of this is food for thoughts i hope you find it useful and we'll talk again next week goodbye thank you.